Hello, my friend, and welcome to TFU News and Views. I am your host, Anthony Bricali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info, the website, the Toy Archive, this podcast, Transformers University podcast, and oh, so much more. I want to welcome you to episode number 52 of TFU News and Views, and it's an uh, interesting episode uh, it's because it's one I've had in the works for quite a while and, and actually started recording it. Um, say three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm using any of that audio uh, because I wasn't happy with how it was coming up. I wasn't happy with uh, the thought process. It felt a little bit all over the place. So I'm hoping this one, uh, this version of this episode uh, isn't as all over the place as uh, the previous recording. Now with that in mind, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, my week on Twitter uh, because it's been kind of a crazy week for me on Twitter. Uh, just recently I appeared on uh, Mike Seibert's uh, podcast. Uh, if you don't know Mike, you've probably heard him on Transformers University. Go check it out. Mike Seibert Radio, uh, the MSRP podcast, my favorite Transformers adjacent podcast. And uh, we had some conversations about the current state of BotCon and, and a whole bunch of other things. And, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure... <laughs> I would say I stepped in it, but I went back and re-listened to the audio and um, nothing I said was untruthful about my feelings uh, or about um, my perception of the convention. Uh, I did I did botch a date. I meant to say 2004 at one point when I said 2005 and um, I conflated Dennis Barger with Greg Berger and made, them, made him into uh, Greg Barger, which uh, is, uh, as far as I know, not a real person. <laughs> So, uh, those are the couple just, you know, uh, misspoken words, but, uh, other than that, um, everything else there was, was straight up about, uh, both my feelings about how, how things worked from my perception as a fan and, uh, my perception of my friends' feelings and people I, uh, I would attend those conventions with. And it just based on simple facts of like, how many of those people were there in one year versus the final year I went? Um, and, you know, when you go from a group of 50 plus people to a group of five, uh, my my points and uh, the things I mentioned in that podcast, and please go check it out over at the Mike Cybert Radio podcast, uh, the things I mentioned in that episode uh, are all very valid and uh, true. So I thought that would be the only <laughs> bit of craziness uh, in my week on Twitter. And then I went and made a new t-shirt design. And the reason I'm talking about that here um, is because it was, it was kind of a joke. Um, it was kind of also my belief as a as this website and this podcast uh, that I do not cover third party. Uh, I do not collect third party, nor am I interested in third party. I, I do feel it is... Um, uh, for the most part, a, a violation of, of, you know, our, our f I would say, of my fandom. Um, not here to like someone else's interpretation of, of the official product and then see them not give credit back to the original source. Um, I think that's part me as an artist, as a creator, uh, that, that when you create something, whether you're a multi- million dollar company or you know your guy in his garage uh the creator has uh ultimate right over that uh at least until like winnie the pooh you know public domain starts to apply so with that in mind i created a shirt and maybe you've seen it uh it's up on our t public store uh and that's the username tfu info over at tpublic.com uh and i'll include a link in the show notes uh if you want to check out the store we do have four shirt designs up right now and the fourth one being um a shirt that just said it said always official and had three p with a uh, a knot uh don't sign like a no smoking sign on it um man <laughs> people get annoyed um i'm actually kind of shocked and then uh, because one, it doesn't tell you as the person on the other side of that shirt to not collect third party or to not buy third party. Um, it only really signifies that the wearer of the shirt, if it was someone like myself, um, is not interested in third party and only purchases official, uh, stuff. That's it. But boy, 
people really took that the wrong way. Um, you know, it, it, part of me was, was a bit shocked. Part of me was like realizing that um, this might be a generational thing and an age thing. Uh, a friend of mine pointed out that, uh, uh, you know, I pointed out how young some of the people that were really mad at me uh, were and how they were replying because it was like, oh, you'll get stuck, stuffed into a locker. I First off, first off, <laughs> I, grew, I grew up in a school system that couldn't afford lockers. And second off, um, it's it's been 25 years since I've graduated. I'm not really worried about ever being stuffed into a locker, I'll tell you that. Uh, um, but then, you know, thinking about it through a different lens, uh, as I was talking with a friend of mine, and he had pointed out that, that yeah, most of that age range of the people that were mad are probably between 15 and 19. And the amount of time and effort it took for them to save up for that one third party figure in their collection, um, it holds like a very special place to them, most likely. And uh, regardless of your, your stance on third party, I get it. I get what it's like to be a teenager and identify with something, especially through a T-shirt. I mean, uh, I think back in the 90s when when I was growing up, uh, you know, in high school and in college, um, you know, that's kind of how I, you identified with who you hung out with. It was your clothing, right? It was, it was usually based on music, right? What music you listened to. Um but yeah, I, I don't know if, if, if someone came at, came into school with a, uh, no heavy metal shirt on, um, you know, or uh, always, always Simon and Garfunkel. I, yeah, maybe, maybe I would be bothered by it. I don't know. Um, or maybe I would see it for what it was, uh, a clever joke and just move on. Um, either way, I, but I get it. I get it. And I think that helped me frame what I wanted to say for uh, part of this episode in, in particular. Uh, and that goes to how deeply um, we are rooted in our identity to things, the fictional things, this podcast, toy collecting, transformers, whatever you want to call it. Um, right. It, it, it's, it fandom becomes part of us as opposed to us just appreciating something outside of us. And uh, it's an, it's an interesting thing to walk down i know i've talked about it a little bit um actually talked a little bit about it on the on mike's podcast and you know it, it it almost boils back to to sports right that that joke about rooting for laundry that you're not necessarily rooting for the players or the location um you're rooting for the uniform they're wearing and we probably trace that back to a little bit to politics too right like you know it's my team wins your team loses it, it's I don't know if it's a healthy way to be, but I think that's where we are as a society. And that shirt kind of <laughs> kind of proved it to me in, in some ways. And it's interesting to look at fandom through that lens because I think part of the issue with fandom right now is that everything we consume as as purchasers as viewers of things we watch uh hinges around knowing what we're going to get ahead of time in some way um and that is the nostalgia game that uh that i feel like is being played uh with us as a whole and I, it's not necessarily to say it's good or it's bad um just to say that it is and you know part of the criticism currently of the Transformers brand is that there's nothing new. There's um, a very heavily reliance on G1 and folks who grew up with, with other things such as the Unicron trilogy or prime or animated are not feeling represented and that you know, Hasbro isn't putting on their t-shirt, so to speak. Uh, and <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting concept to me because First off, a lot of that is still rooted in G1. But also, what is the end goal there? What, what is the goal? Is it to be able to relive your childhood as nostalgia? Or is it to experience something you missed out on? So if you were too young for Transformers Animated and you caught it in reruns and you can't afford to purchase a vintage figure to have something you know, a modern take on something that is now almost 15 years old. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. 
Um, but it really got me thinking about how we interact with nostalgia, right? Because as someone who grew up in in the who was born in the late seventies and grew up in the eighties and was a teenager in the nineties, I can kind of observe um, the wave of nostalgia. How we've moved f- slowly, starting to move away from the eighties nostalgia, though it's still there, um, and into uh, 90s nostalgia, which is really coming on strong. I heard the other day that they're, they're considering doing a Hanging with Mr. Cooper reboot. Like, I mean, they're digging deep into 90s nostalgia. Uh, and 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 it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, where does that stop? Because you hit the 2000s, you start to get the 80s nostalgia again. And then we start going into a bit of a loop, right? So it got me thinking, like, how do we engage with... Um, just media as a whole, fictional media that we enjoy, right? And I kind of broke it into uh, probably four-ish buckets. I'll explain. Um, first, I'll actually work backwards, right? So first there's the reboot, right? The rehash of an old franchise, you know, you have a setting within a known quantity, right? So you know, the last couple of Transformers series, uh, War for Cybertron trilogy, or even Cyberverse, or which is different a different take um to some extent but for the most part autobots decepticons fighting on on cybertron on ending war you know the, the kind of thing you see fairly fairly regularly right or even just a continuation star wars continuing the original trilogy or you know the marvel cinematic universe for the most part um these are all pieces of an older franchise of, of a familiar world Right. And going into the, that world, you know what you're getting. Um, you know, I used to always say that the best superhero sequel, and this is pre Marvel, Marvel Cinematic Universe, was X Men 2. And that was probably up until, I don't know, Days of Future Past. But uh, because you didn't have to learn the characters all over again, uh, you went into that movie knowing who was who and what they did and what the Xavier School was. And you met a few new people along the way. But the world was set up in a way where, you can just hit the ground running and that movie just kind of takes you from start to finish uh, without having you to do too much backstory, too much uh, exposition to kind of get you to the end. And I think that's the idea, right? So that, that rehash of an old franchise or something set in a known quantity, that is kind of the base level for um, nostalgia. And that's kind of where we engage right now in, uh, in our media, it's kind of the, the go-to for most people is, is to go to that thing that they already know that they already like. Now, one step removed from that is probably uh, the new idea within, old, within an old franchise. Um, you know, things that necessarily are concepts that are new to you, um, but that's not necessarily the thing that it was to begin with. Um, a good example for this is probably like, I haven't seen it, but but from what I read, like Star Trek uh, Lower Decks. Uh, another good example for me is always um, G.I. Joe Renegades, uh, which I always say is the A-Team <laughs> done as G.I. Joe. Uh, it's two familiar concepts, but kind of, you know, putting your chocolate in the peanut butter and getting something new out of it. Um, those That new idea within an old concept is is also like Transformers Animated is a good example of that, right? It's, um, it's a lighter version of the Transformers story. It's a different version of of the Autobots and Decepticons told as a story. Um, there's, there's a war, but not really. It's more about these, you know, space bridge repairmen who end up on earth, right? And a cube and, and, and all the things that go wrong with that. So it takes elements that, you know, but kind of puts a twist on them. Uh, a good example also is, you know, the, 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 both new masters of the universe series revelation, though it's supposedly like set in, uh, the filmation universe is still fairly different, and it's a darker take on the original series in a lot of ways. But it's it's still a good uh, take. Or the other one, He Man and the Masters of the Universe, the younger aimed one, where I kind of say that is um, He Man as told through a Final Fantasy lens. <laughs> Maybe that's just the visual design of that, right? But that that is what that looks like um, in this kind of concept in, in this uh, nostalgia hierarchy that that we're we're looking at uh so there so think about how you engage right so if you do you engage in things that are just a rehash or reboot of of your old franchise of things you know and you know what also goes in those categories of shows like uh the walking dead and game of thrones where um 
as it's jumping from medium from say comics to TV or books to TV, things have to change a little bit uh, to, because for practical reasons, um, you know, number of actors, people's contracts uh, and just telling a different story that isn't already been told. Um, but for the most part, right, we're still in that kind of realm. So that goes back to the previous one, but that new idea within world franchise, that's the, the twist, the spinoff series, the um, things that are just kind of new to you. Uh, I feel like the next level down, the next level that we engage with, uh, and, and, and as we go through these, these are the things that are probably increasingly harder for you to engage with as a fan, right? You rather watch the thing you know versus the twist on the thing you know, and you rather watch the twist that you uh, on the thing you know versus uh, a new idea from a known quantity. Um, that's the next one, right? So, you know, from <laughs> and those get harder to accept, right? So, like taking it outside of, of visual entertainment, right? Like for music, right? If your favorite artist kind of switches styles between from one record to the next, chances are, especially if they came off a really good record, you're not going to be happy with that next record, right? Even though for the artist, that might be more fulfilling. Um, in, in visual media, it's kind of the same thing, right? Um, taking a new idea from a known quantity. Uh, a good example of this is Invincible, uh, either the comic or the TV show. Um, because... Robert Kirkman kind of has this reputation for The Walking Dead. You know, you may want to take the risk, even though it's a completely different, you know, storytelling style and a completely different um, concept, right? You're, you're willing to jump into that new world because you know who the creator is. Um, that can even boil down to, hey, this is from Stephen King. I like Stephen King. Yeah, I know, like, somehow, like, a lot of his books are all connected in a way, but for the most part, you, you they kind of live on their own as well, right? So you can take that jump. Um, it's a new idea from a known quantity. You know, and somewhere in between these two is um, an old idea from a different medium. Uh, I think maybe this is a five level hierarchy, right? So you have the rehash of an old franchise, you have the new idea within a new franchise, right? Within an old franchise, I mean, so that, that twist, and then right probably in between the new idea from a known quantity and that is a known quantity changing mediums, such as taking something from a comic book and putting it on TV, going from TV to comic, uh, or vice versa, like that whole thing going from books to a visual medium, all that stuff kind of exists in that middle ground between levels three and two or two and three um, in terms of being able to engage with it because if it doesn't quite fit your perception of what the original was, you're more likely to bail and more likely to not stay on board with it. Now, finally, the bottom level, the hardest for us to engage with at this point in time in 2022 um, is a brand new idea. Uh, what's the chances you're going to take a risk on that versus the other three or four levels, right? Um, something you, you have to have either probably word of mouth. Someone told you something you liked a trailer. Um, it is certainly the hardest way to infiltrate people. And, and it's weird because 25 years ago, it was always about new. It was like, here's this new thing dressed up and it might be something old. It might be, um, something very similar to something you saw before here but not exactly the same it's little it's it's the two things approach uh, you know it's it, it, like much like my uh, gi joe retaliation it's gi joe done as uh 18 but if someone just took gi joe and 18 made one thing and put a name on it you may wa might watch it good example is mask right mask is essentially gi joe plus transformers uh as kids totally wanted to watch that um thundercats is he-man with with uh, animals, <laughs> people, animals. Uh, yeah, definitely want to watch that. I, the idea that you would just jump into these things and figure out if you like them uh, is because there's so much more to consume these days. There's not necessarily time to take that risk. Um, I know I've seen myself take that risk with a few things. Uh, Squid Game is a good example for a lot of people uh, because you heard about it word of mouth from people. Um myself bluey <laughs> because of my daughter watching it uh, has become one of my favorite shows and kind of exists in its own you know little universe of, of things and uh, I enjoy the hell out of it <laughs> really uh, but you know the likely and, and I was resistant to it at first too. come to think of it um, 
I was like, what are these weird dogs with, with, with Australian accents and why do I want to watch them? Um, but, but having on the background just it eventually charmed the hell out of me. So uh, I think, you know, that's the harder thing, the harder way to, to infiltrate people uh, in their um, consumption whether it be actually spending money on something or just giving their time to watch, listen, etc. Harder thing is getting that new idea into people. So which is what leaves Transformers and Hasbro in this very weird space because as fans, we're continually wanting something new, but we also want uh, tributes to old and new takes on old. And so how many of these levels four or five however you want to flip this four because we're not switching mediums right um let me rephrase that we're not switching media media is the plural of medium uh it's one of my pet peeves <laughs> we're, we're gonna rephrase that but um it's so easy to slip into isn't it uh we're not switching media here so it's really those four levels the rehash of an old franchise new idea within an old franchise idea from a known quantity and new idea. So if this were toys, right? So rehash is G1 forever, right? Um, the idea that we're kind of filling in gaps uh, that they haven't done yet from G1 in generations. New idea with an old franchise, that is kind of the, hey, we missed that character. Uh, we haven't gotten a DevCon yet, for argument's sake, right? Let's do DevCon. That, that's that next level down. And then you get the next, next level down. New idea from a known quantity. So new idea from a known quantity. That is like Alpha Bravo. Uh, you know, a new character within the aerial bots that replaces an old character that is part of that line, right? So however you feel about that particular use of a new character, that, that's a way to do a new, new idea from a known quantity. You know the aerial bots, you know they turned to Superion, and now they have a helicopter. And then finally is straight up new idea. Um, that could be Cyberverse. That could be just a brand new character and turns into something cool. Um, I don't think we've seen enough of that. And uh, I, I think that is uh, the conundrum right, that we run into. And I don't know if we're going to see much more beyond that, that hierarchy, right? So if we talk about Hasbro's current approach, this is one I'm not terribly uh, a fan of uh, in some ways. Uh, what I see now, especially now that we have the news that there's going to be a legacy Galvatron with no battle damage on him, Hasbro has shown that they are kind of really enjoying doing um, multiple iterations of the same toy uh, within the same few years, and not just like the whatever the logical recolor is, right, or the special edition recolor, but doing it in a way where we're going to put out an imperfect version first and do a less imperfect version later. So, hey, there'll be battle damage on this one, and then this one will be toy colors, and this one will be some sort of special box art colors, and then finally we'll do the one that you really wanted two years later, three figures later. Um, I, I, you know, part of me wants them to go just do it right out, right out of the gate, right? If they know that's the way they're going to go, do it right out of the gate, and then do the subsequent less popular versions later. Um. And, and and kind of seeing it a lot with with their releases. I mean, if you look from Siege to Earthrise, we saw it. We saw it with um, Walgreens uh, and Walgreens uh, Earth Mode Red Alert, and then the Earth Mode Sideswipe that came out a couple of years later. We had uh, the the three Dotsons uh, all come out in those Cybertronium modes, and then get retooled into you know the standard Earth modes later on. Uh, just I feel like you know we saw it with kingdom optimus prime and then the walmart special edition optimus prime like and now with four four galvatrons out of one mold uh, on a figure that doesn't have a logical recolor other than toy and cartoon colors um i i appreciate the the effort they go to 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 kind of bring multiple versions of toys and the smart thing they're doing is they are spreading it out over a longer period of time but the approach and this is where we kind of go back to fandom and one of the things um, that I've been thinking about with fandom uh, is based off of a baseball author, actually, uh, by the name of uh, Craig Calcaterra, who has a book on fandom coming out that that uh, it's coming out in April. You should check it out. Uh, I'm probably going to check it out. Uh, but I think 
you know, his observations on baseball, the problem with baseball, and I know I kind of bring these back to baseball because I worked in it for 10 years, um, is that they're continuing to find ways to ask their fans for more money. So instead of growing the game and creating new fans and creating a, a cascading effect of people coming in as fans, and growing up, bringing their families in as fans, and they, those folks bringing their families in as fans, and so on and so on. They've focused on, hey, these are the fans we have, and that's it. And we're going to just try to extrapolate as much money from them as possible. And with the focus on early G1, that is my concern as far as Transformers goes. Um, because the early G1 folks like myself, who were kids when that came out, we're not getting any younger. So are you growing the fan base? Are you growing the fandom by continuing to go down the road of these characters and not develop those new characters? Is Hasbro just happy saying, you know what, we're going to see how many times we can get you to dip in on this one Galvatron mold. Um, And that's up to you to decide if you want to do that, right? But we're going to test those waters. And if you do that, we might try it again with another figure. And we might try it again with another figure. And so my only concern with that as a fan is that I don't want to see that approach. I want to see new. I think a lot of people want to see new. And I think that's where people are starting to have this G1 fatigue. And with that, we're going to wrap things up here on TFU News and Views. I am your host, Anthony Brucali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info. Until next time, see ya. Want to be on the show? Leave us a voicemail at 702-763-4838. That's 702-POD-4TFU. Or send an email to info at tfu.info. Be sure to catch us on Twitter at TFU underscore info and on Facebook and Instagram under the username TFU info, all one word. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TFU info, where we post all of our podcasts plus special video segments, reviews, and live coverage of Transformers related events such as New York Toy Fair and New York Comic Con. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please visit us at www.tfu.info, the world's longest-running transforming toy archive.